Hello again, welcome back to another day, another week of daily Bible study. We are partway through the week already because there were some interruptions in our community that prevented me from getting these done earlier. Uh, we're going to pick up the day and go for the rest of the week. Uh, we're in 1 Peter. We're going to start chapter 4 today. I uh, look at some, some interesting things he has to say there. Before we do that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, you tell us things that we need to hear through your servant, Peter. Lord, help us understand um, what it is we need to know. Help us understand that you are doing what is right. And Lord, help us to, to weigh the ideals that you called us to and the realities that we face. Uh, Lord, for you tell us both of those things. Lord, we ask you to be with us during this time, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, in our last passage, we looked at this idea of, of Jesus going and preaching to those who were in prison, and the idea being that those who have, who have died already. We're going to refer to that again here. But uh, we continue on with Peter saying, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. So we, we had here, um, one, an example, again, that this acknowledgement that Jesus goes to proclaim the gospel to those who are dead, that this idea of being dead doesn't get us off the hook. Now, what exactly does this mean? Um, I, I had a professor who would talk about questions about what, what does it mean, uh, the scope of salvation, how do we know, like, like uh, people who die, for example, without ever having heard the name of Jesus, you know, not through any fault of their own, but actually through the failure of the church to be faithful witnesses to the ends of the earth. Uh, what do we do with that? And at least some people have suggested that because of passages like this and because of the passages like the one we just had at the end of last week, um, that death is not necessarily a barrier to hearing the gospel. That we have this idea that if God puts such a high priority on hearing the gospel proclaimed, that he would go to um, you know, to those who were in prison, as it says, uh, to proclaim, then there must be it must be very important to hear the gospel. And so at least some people have suggested that, um, that if we have not heard the gospel in this life, then we will hear it at the juncture between now and the next life. Now, now, that doesn't get us off the hook for a variety of reasons. I'm not trying to advocate for that position necessarily. My point is just to say that these passages are interesting and they are a bit strange and they don't have much parallel outside of this book in the rest of the New Testament. Um, and yet we do know the early church um, found a lot of value in them and it became a part of what it means to have this triumph over sin. Um, I do want to highlight that there, there's, there's, a, there's language here that if we see it out of context, it might be odd. And that is, it says, um, you know, he who has suffered, he, see, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of to the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. I think that if we take that as simply being cause and effect, if someone has suffered in the flesh, they have stopped sinning for the rest of their lives. I think that we would say that is manifestly untrue. So wildly untrue that either Peter has absolutely no idea what he's talking about to be just on the surface false, or he's making a different kind of point. And um, it seems as though what he's saying is somebody who is so committed to the gospel that they are that they're willing to endure sufferings rather than turn their back on the gospel, rather than turn their back on Jesus, that this is a person who has really committed themselves for their inevitable, you know, indefinite future uh, into the care of Jesus. And we see all that, that this, the, the person that Peter's describing here is somebody who he says they've lived their life for the desire of the Gentiles. They lived their life doing the things that the world considers important. They've ex had that experience. They've done it. And they don't need to go back to it. They, they, they already know everything that that life has to offer. And they know it to be inferior to what God has to offer through Christ. So I think that's really significant here. And also this idea of that, that um, you know, I've been thinking about with passages in here and passages in 2 Corinthians on Sunday mornings. I've been really struggling or wrestling with this idea of we are ambassadors and to expect mistreatment. And I think that it's important that we grasp that, the fact that, that being mistreated does not mean that we're behaving mean-spiritedly. It doesn't mean that we are like uh, full of anger toward other people. It doesn't mean that we're being excessively judgmental. Um, you know, it, but one of the things that's important is to saying, you know, the people are going to be surprised if you don't run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. They're going to malign you. Um, I had a friend of mine who, and I, he was perhaps a bit abrupt and a bit more... Um, uh, you know, short with his 
friends than he maybe should have been. But a, a friend of mine at one point, this is ages and ages and ages ago, um, really started giving his life more to Jesus. And he realized his friends were being a destructive influence for him. And so he kind of cut off ties. And he did it in a way that may not have been the most great for the gospel, uh, for the witness. Now, again, I mean, man, he was in high school. He had a pretty dramatic transition. You know, I'm not going to try to judge him about that. But my point is just to say, you know, just the act of saying, I'm not going to do the things I used to do. I'm not going to join you in the things that we used to do together is enough to really um, drive some people up the wall. And so we do have to make a choice. Well, what does that mean for our lives? Do we continue along the way the world goes? Do we continue along the way that our friends do? Or do we not? And I think there's different ways of doing it in a way that has integrity and also uh, does not kind of make us uh, complicit in the midst of it. Uh, but it is something that takes some navigation and is difficult. But in any case, the point here seems to be uh, that this is that this the person is not really actually so free from sin as just to not be impacted by the issues of sin, but simply they've drawn a line in their lives and they have crossed over it and they're never going back. This idea of to commit to the point of suffering for the gospel uh, is really a, a, a big deal and is one that... Um, you know, when someone's willing to really put their money where their mouth is, so to speak, uh, it's hard to accuse them of hypocrisy. You may not agree with them, may not like how they do things, uh, but it's hard to, to, to conclude they don't actually mean what they say. Well, that's all for today. Come back tomorrow. We'll have another day of uh, First Peter. Have a good day.